Welcome to the brainstorm episode 64. Frank, you're back again because AI just don't stop. We've got Cerebrus and AI chip company filed their S1 to go public. So we'll dive into that. But first, we'd like to give a shout out to Public, who's uh, actually helped co-produce the brainstorm since the very first episode. Uh, And they've got a podcast called The Rundown, and this is a daily markets podcast. So if you're looking for a quick hitting daily market update, check out The Rundown. And I think there's a link in the bio for this episode. Uh, All right, Frank, what makes Cerebra special? Can they compete with NVIDIA and everyone else who's going after AI chips? Yeah. Semiconducting. Um, oh, there's so much to talk about in this space. It's been, it's been fun to fo- follow. But to give you know, just the, the lay of the land, NVIDIA basically owns production AI infrastructure right now. So they have a vast majority of the market, but that market is big and growing very quickly. So there are a lot of competitors coming online and actually have been building for many years to compete with them though it's it's hard to do. They're very good at it and achieving a performance advantage and keeping that performance advantage is hard. So there's companies like AMD that are competing with NVIDIA already in the GPU market uh, for gaming that are bringing uh, their um, IP over to the accelerator space. And then there are companies that are building purpose-built chips for AI, um, both training and inference workloads. And Cerebrus is one of these companies that's building a a custom-built chip um, that's coming at it a different way uh, than what a lot of other uh, manufacturers are doing uh, and trying to kind of compete for these AI workloads. Uh, And what they're most known for is what they call their wafer scale engine, uh, which is essentially a giant pizza box-sized compute um, unit that is essentially the maximizing what you can get from a silicon wafer. They cut one big square out of it. It's a highly advanced technology. They had to work especially with TSM to build the manufacturing for it. They're on their third generation and had to iterate several times to get uh, everything kind of dialed in. And that chip is significantly larger if you look at, at, at pictures comparing them than the second largest chip on the market, NVIDIA's B200. Um, and by making a very big chip, you get certain advantages with uh, power efficiency, with the scale of compute you can do with a single unit, which simplifies your network architecture. Um, all of these things are great. We can go, go get into with more detail, but you're also starting with a new ecosystem. You have to attract developers. What's the carrot that's going to get them to stop using NVIDIA and start using your chip, which is the question that all of these companies have to solve. Um, and I think Cerebrus is doing a, a pretty good job at it. And the downside there of such a giant chip is, is that just yield where, right, if anything is flawed on the chip, you lose the whole thing uh, as opposed to being able to cut around it? Yeah, exactly. So if you normally are dicing up a chip, let's just say into 20 pieces uh, or a wafer into 20 pieces, and each one of those is going to be turned into a AI accelerator, if there's an, uh, an error in one part of the wafer, you can throw out that one part, but you still have 19 out of 20 good chips. With Cerebrus' technology, if there's an error, the whole wafer could stop working. So you need to have kind of this advanced error correcting technology that they've built in and seem to have gotten to a pretty good state over three iterations. Um, right. And maybe I'll just, I'll tell a bit of the story of it, because if you've talked to Cerebrus or heard their presentations in the last uh, five years or so, um, started... Uh, by a guy who left AMD after selling his company to AMD and working there for a few years. Um, they It's been a training story where they've built this chip and it, first we're selling it into research labs for scientific computing workloads, so not even really traditional AI. Uh, but then we're applying that chip to AI training use cases and we're able to see a, a performance parity relative to cost with NVIDIA, I would say. But because the chip is so big and you can use fewer chips to do the same amount of work, they actually had a much easier developer experience. Um, So the pitch was really, rather than having all of these network and and cloud engineers that need to string together 16,000 GPUs, what if you could do that work with uh, 12 or 24 CS3s? You need a lot less infrastructure engineers and you can repurpose that talent into building and training your models. So it's a a better developer experience. Um, But... 
I think what has been most interesting when what they've released most recently is their inference suite, which I didn't know this chip that they built and was being used for training was also going to be good at inference. But what they've built really with the software stack around it is ultra high fast inference that can run models depending on you know what you look at over 10 times faster than what you can run on a GPU for a mid-sized llama model, um, which is, is really important lately. And so that, yeah, so you say that's really important lately. So does this mean, right, uh, GPT-01 now stops to think because they saw, you know, you get improvement in answers if you stop and think on the inference side as well. So does this mean with this hardware, it can think faster? And so latency on inference is decreased? Yeah, that's the general idea. Um, so latency, whenever you have a kind of... A, a, a model right up against the end user experience. Latency is important because it makes a difference whether you ask a question to, I'll just use ChatGPT as an example, and it takes a second to respond versus 10 seconds versus 10 minutes. The user experience gets worse as that um, latency grows or the time to respond grows. So just being faster generally is better. Uh, but with this new class of reasoning models like O1 from OpenAI, which stop to think, you can picture if you have a latency budget of three seconds before the user starts getting annoyed and your chip can process tokens twice as fast, that means you can do twice as much thinking in the same amount of time. Uh, so the output from models over the same amount of time could actually be better on faster chips like Cerebrus's chips than on competitor chips. Um, and this is, you know, right now the reasoning models in this fashion are, are proprietary open AI models. Um, which Microsoft will choose and OpenAI will choose whatever infrastructure they want for those. But as you see this make its way into the open source community, I think you'll see a lot of demand for ultra fast inference and, and, and developers uh, seeking out a solution like Cerebrus, which previously they've been kind of selling that solution out. I think that demand pull is now starting to come to them, which is, is an advantageous position to be in. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you, we, we're not going to talk valuation or anything that would violate anything compliance wise, but going through the S1, um, what stands out to you? It's, you know, what, what are you tracking when you're looking at a company like Cerebrus, uh, to determine how they're executing and if you think they'll find success? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at just, they gave, um, like I'll take their first half revenue 2023 versus first half revenue 2024. They made uh, $8.6 million in revenue in the first half of 2023. So really like a, a year and a half ago, a pre-revenue company. Uh, and they're still losing money on a net income basis. Um, so still investing more in the business than kind of just scaling, scaling positive uh, uh, gross profit, which I think is what we, we are a net profit, which is what we want to see at, at a company at this stage. But their revenue the first half of this year, so year on year, was $136 million. So really seeing some... Uh, exponential growth and, and pick up there. But I think that's still, if you think of 136 million in revenue for the first half of this year, maybe you'd annual, annualize it to 250 million plus over the full year is really small compared to NVIDIA doing 100 billion in data center revenue. So the, the opportunity size, if they can actually penetrate into this market is really large. And I think it also, their business model is likely going to be shifting with this new inference suite that they have where they're Sales previously have been really um, hardware sales and then services to help companies that are buying their hardware. G42 is one of the companies that's uh, their primary purchaser of chips. So they're selling them chips and selling them services to um, make, uh, make best use of those chips and train models on those chips. But with inference, developers really want tokens and they want tokens fast. So Cerebus has now launched a cloud service where they're hosting open source models from Meta and others and just making those tokens available to end developers. They don't even need to know what infrastructure is powering it underneath. They're just getting the end output, which is a hosted model at a cheaper and faster rate than they would get from the major clouds. And so that service should be, as long as they can actually scale up their own hardware and the manufacturing process, uh, be um, higher uh, margin and more scalable for them over time. So I want to see, you know, as they start to give forecasts and come to the public markets, how quickly they can execute against that and how their capacity will grow as they take this new funding and, and put it into more infrastructure. All right. We're going to keep this episode 
pretty short and snappy. Frank, any any last thoughts here before we? This is we're recording this on Monday, so we're looking to see the uh, weather report for for Milton. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe some cerebrous uh, scientific computing uh, tiles can forecast the hurricane better, so we can see. But um, uh, no, the last thing I would say is that. I think is unique is that they have achieved something quite unique, which is a chip that is both good one package, good at training and best in class at inference for models of a certain size. So it's not that it's going to be scalable up to the largest models um, with the speed, but, uh, and that what that means is that a company looking to acquire more infrastructure doesn't need to size and purchase their training compute separate from their inference compute. They can have one package that is flexible across both, which allows you to reduce complexity and increase the average utilization of your chips. And there's a lot of companies out there that have built inference specific chips that are fast, not quite as fast as Cerebrus, but purpose built for inference and, and not as good as training. So you're sacrificing there. NVIDIA is a company that is, you know, generally useful across both, and that's been advantageous to them. And Cerebra seems like they're kind of building into that similar position, um, which I which I think is is pretty unique. All right, we'll see. We'll see if they can make a dent in NVIDIA's fortress. All right, we'll see. We'll see everyone next week, and we hope that everyone in the Florida region is safe.